Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third of a series of uh, webinars organized uh, with ERN Rita with, in collaboration with UVAS, the European Vascularity Society. This is the third uh, webinar. There will be another one next Tuesday. Uh, this was the Vasculitis Awareness Month, and you're all, all very welcome to this session. Uh, Christina Ponti will chair this session and we'll start in a few minutes once uh, more people connect. Thank you for being here. So thank you, Sara. Now it's my time to talk. Um, so I'm very happy that we're now having a session on infections in ank associated vasculitis. It's a very important topic uh, in these diseases. So we will have two speakers today, both uh, consultant nephrologists. The first one will be Andreas Kronblikwe, and I hope I'm saying this correctly. I really tried, Andreas. Now he's saying yes, so I'm happy. And so he will basically give a brief overhaul, uh, overall uh, overview of the clinical side of infections, which is always important. And then we'll move to uh, Federico, Federico Alberici, which is, who is from um, Brescia University, Italy. And he'll basically focus more on biomarkers, et cetera, on, of course, related to infections. At the end, please don't forget, we have a, a chat box. You can write any questions you have for both speakers, just one, and we'll monitor in the end and ask those questions. Um, and without any further delay, I think we are, a, we are ready to start, right? So, Andreas, please just go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Christina, thank you, Sarah, for the possibility to present today and it's uh, my great pleasure to present together with my with my good friend uh, Federico Alberici, who I know since a couple of years already. So um, let's get that started. So on the agenda, I will, as mentioned, talk more about um, clinical issues we are facing in anchor associated vasculitis, and especially when it comes to infections. Of course, we are talking about risk factors. We are also talking about prophylaxis. We are slightly touching upon immunocompetence, but this is, of course, something Federico will talk about later on. And, of course, he is also touching upon uh, acquired secondary immunodeficiency, a problem we are frequently encountering in the management of patients with anchor associated vasculitis. So, one of the issues with infections is that it's one of the key drivers of mortality. So when looking at early mortality, and this is data from the earlier UVAS trials, Mark Little and, and colleagues found that the more aggressive you're treating patients, and MEPEX was a trial comparing IV metolopatnisolone versus a plasma exchange on top of oral cyclophosphamide plus a high dose of steroids. And you can see that a lot of patients died here, and most patients, so over 50%, died of infections, so that was within the first year. But a similar trend was seen in the other trials where a lower uh, frequency of patients died actually, but most died in the first year to do uh, infectious complications. And if we are looking nowadays into observational data, this is a, a very nice study from uh, Boston led by Zach Wallace, looking at a more contemporary uh, cohort collected over 15 years, and they included uh, over 400 patients in total, and you can see 270 with MPO anchor vasculitis, 160 with br 3 anchor vasculitis. Then they looked at what's observed in terms of mortality and what is expected actually in terms of background population. You can see that the standardized mortality ratio, that is uh, basically the excess mortality you're facing in AAV, is 2.3, and this is uh, higher actually when you look at MPO anchor vasculitis. Then they focused on different forms of mortality, so cardiovascular mortality, um, also active vasculitis, and so on. But what you can see here is when they focused on infection mortality, you have a standardized mortality ratio of uh, almost 14 in the overall cohort. Again, MPO anchor vasculitis was leading here in comparison to br 3 anchor vasculitis, but both diseases actually had increased mortality rates. And this is important to know, um, patients with MPO anchor in this group were 10 years older, so you would expect more infectious complications 
and you would expect a higher mortality rate in MPO anchor in comparison to BR3 anchor vasculitis. When it comes to clinical trials, uh, severe infections are definitely underrepresented in comparison to a real life cohort. Looking at the RAVE trial, so the most important trial leading to the approval of uh, rituximab, they reported around 12% serious infections within the first 18 months in the rituximab arm in comparison to 11 events in the cyclophosphamide azathioprine arm. That means that only roughly 10% of these patients uh, develop the serious infections, and that is definitely lower than in a real-life cohort. So when is infectious risk high? And this is a very elegant trial from uh, Chapel Hill, and they clearly show that if you look at serious infections and you look at one, two, and five years, the cumulative incidence, and this is well reflected here in the figure, is the highest actually in the first couple of months, but actually in the first six months, it's the highest uh, risk ratio to develop a, a serious infection. What are the risk factors? Again, here, higher age is, of course, a risk factor. Female sex, steroid-induced diabetes mellitus, a low EGFR, so a patient uh, population we are facing in nephrology. And if you look at serious infection, then death from any cause, you can see that those patients developing a serious infection do have a, a certainly higher uh, death uh, or mortality rate in comparison to those with no infections or non-severe infections. Um, this is a, a study from, from Greece looking at specific risk factors, including over 160 patients. And again, as mentioned before, in an observational study, then the risk of serious infections is certainly higher than in a clinical trial. And most of these infections, as mentioned already, occurred within the first year of diagnosis. As risk factors, lower EGFR, as already mentioned here, again, identified as a specific risk factor, then higher age actually driving infectious complication, and they actually also investigated whether plasma exchange plus minus uh, being on hemodialysis is a risk factor. And you clearly see that if you perform plasma exchange or if you uh, undergo hemodialysis, you have a higher risk to develop severe infection during the follow-up period. We have looked at uh, rituximab-treated patients a couple of years ago, including almost 200 patients who received reduximab either as induction treatment or maintenance treatment. And we found, again, roughly 25% of patients had a serious infection. And that was mainly driven by lower and upper respiratory tract infections, followed by urinary tract infections. Again, if looking at risk factor, age emerged as an independent risk factor, but uh, disease manifestations such as severe lung involvement, uh, pre Previous uh, comorbidities such as COPD also emerged as a risk factor. And the treatment we are not giving nowadays, but uh, back in the days, alemtuzumab actually also emerged as a risk factor. What is known from clinical trials, and um, it's also important to stress negative risk factors, and one of the best examples for that is the LOVAS trial, a very elegant phase four trial comparing uh, reduced dose glucocorticoid exposure alongside rituximab as induction treatment to a so-called high dose glucocorticoid uh, regimen. The caveat here is it was mainly MBO anchor vasculitis. It was performed in Japanese patients and the EGFR of most patients was over 50 milliliters, so non-severe kidney disease. If you look at the cumulative dose here, over six months, it was only 1.3 in those with the reduced dose in comparison to 4.2 in those with the high dose of glucocorticoid. If you then look at treatment toxicity, you can see that uh, this was significantly reduced in those patients actually receiving the reduced dose glucocorticoid regimen. And importantly, also to mention, there was a significant uh, reduction in serious infections after six months, but also when they reported the longer term outcome. So reduce those glucocorticoids can reduce also the uh, incidence and frequency of serious infections. The most prominent trial 
in ankle vasculitis, the BEXI was trial recruited 704 patients, and those patients either received plasma exchange or no plasma exchange, but also importantly, either reduced dose glucocorticoid regimen in comparison to a standard dose regimen. You can see here in the figure that the composite outcome of death or end-stage kidney disease was reached uh, similarly by the, both of these groups. But if you look at uh, infectious complications and when you focus on serious infections at one year, you can see that the risk ratio was reduced by 31% in those patients actually receiving the re reduced dose regimen. This reduced dose regimen has now been incorporated in all the major uh, guidelines recommendations as the preferred regimen um, when it comes to steroids. What is also known is uh, that if you um, minimize glucocorticoids, as already mentioned, and you aim for a strategy of uh, zero milligrams at uh, six months, you can see that the incidence of infections is certainly reduced in comparison to those patients actually who maintain on lower dose of steroids beyond six months. And this is a significant difference here when it comes to the incidence of infection per person year. Again, uh, as already mentioned before, all other comorbidities complications are also lower, albeit not significant here, such as new onset of diabetes. What is also important is to mention that steroids are also depleting lymphocytes. So this is a study from, from Canada looking at lymphopenia as a specific treatment-related risk factor. So um, glucocorticoids are lymphopenic, but also, of course, as we know, cyclophosphamide can do that. And they recorded 112 infectious complications in 53% of the patients. And uh, some of these patients required hospitalization to do infection, and most of them occurred uh, within the time where the treatment is the most aggressive. Importantly, what they showed is that if you have severe lymphopenia, your event rate in terms of infectious complication, as you would expect, is the highest. And this was compared to those patients with no lymphopenia where the event rate was pretty low. Predictors of lymphopenia, again, those patients with low EGFR, longer duration of steroids, and also longer duration of total immunosuppression. So this is uh, looking at dialysis dependency. And we know that those patients on dialysis have a high burden of infectious complications to do um, basically a central line, but also, of course, they are facing immunocompetence issues. And uh, in this study from France, uh, they showed that 147 out of 229 patients remained on dialysis and infections uh, was, again, the leading cause of mortality with around 35%. And what they did is to look at uh, those patients who received 7.5 milligrams per day of steroids and or additional immunosuppression and those without these high doses of steroids. And they could see that once you reduce the, the dose of steroids in the maintenance phase, you can also reduce the risk of a serious infection. And of course, the infectious complications increased when patients were started on dialysis. So importantly, um, we need to move away also only looking at infectious complications, but also to find potential um, helping hands to prevent infections. And of course, what we know nowadays is that BJB prophylaxis is an important measure to prevent infectious complications, but we should not forget about um, those diseases which we can prevent, such as influenza, hepatitis B, and with the new emergence of uh, inactivated uh, vaccines, such as Zoster vaccines, it's important also to vaccinate our patients against Zoster and, of course, uh, pneumococcal infections. And probably also CMV might play a, a more potent role in AAV as we um, expect so far. So prophylaxis, it's important to mention SOSTA in the first instance, and this is a study from 2005, and I wasn't aware of that uh, until recently. And this is coming from the Widget trial, which compared etanercept in comparison to placebo. 
um, as a maintenance strategy. And what they found is that actually a lot of patients um, presented before inclusion into the trial with SOSTA. But also if you look here, the incidence of SOSTA over time increases and it's really independent of the density of immunosuppression. So this is a, a clear problem in our patient population. Risk factors again, increased serum creatinine and female sex here is also an independent risk factor to develop SOSTA in patients with AAV. What we did back in the days was to look at DMP SMX in those patients receiving reduximab, and we could see that over the period of time, there is a separation of curves, and this was a significant reduction by 70% in serious infections once patients received prophylaxis with trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. What we did recently was looking at the RAVE trial, and what we could found is that most of the patients, so 180, had a DMB SMX as a prophylaxis. 16 patients had alternatives and one patient had no prophylaxis. What we could find, and that was basically confirming what I've told before, most serious infections occurred during the first six months. And if you look at all patients, those receiving rituximab or those receiving cyclophosphamide followed by isodioprine, you could see the same picture. So those receiving DMB SMX had a reduced frequency of serious infections throughout the follow-up period. So I think this certainly underlines that uh, prophylaxis with DMP smx in patients with AAV receiving high dose of steroids plus one of the induction treatments, those patients require DMP SMS, uh, smx as a prophylaxis. So this has also been incorporated as statement number seven in the recent EULA update on management of AAV. And it says that for patients with AAV receiving reduximab, cyclophosphamide, and or high doses of glucocorticoids, we recommend the use of DMP SMX as a prophylaxis against pneumocystis urovetsi, but also other infections. And you can see a lower level of evidence that was before we published um, the recent paper and a low strength of recommendation, but a high level of agreement. So I can conclude my part, infections are the main contributor to excess mortality, especially during the first year of diagnosis. We have several risk factors which have been identified in different cohorts, and most of them have been confirmed in a couple of cohorts, such as age, low EGFR, lymphopenia, diabetes, and the use of higher doses of glucocorticoids. And as mentioned, DMB SMX is significantly associated with reduced risk of serious infections, and we should not forget about uh, SOSTA vaccination in our patient population. With this, I'm handing over to Federico. Okay, thank you, thanks Andreas. I'm not sure you can see my screen. We can, but it's not in presenter mode so far. Okay, excellent, thanks, thanks a lot. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here with my friend Andreas and talk about uh, um, a very interesting topic that is about uh, uh, infection and associated vasculitis. So, uh, my side of the presentation is going to be uh, focused on uh, biomarkers in everyday clinical life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, B cells and try uh, to, to convince you that they may act as biomarkers in rituximab treated patient uh, in terms of risk of infection. Talk about, of course, IgG uh, level and hypogamma globulinemia. These are my, my disclosures. Uh, so a very brief introduction just to uh, bring everybody to the, to the same page and uh, provide a little bit of, uh, of background and, uh, you know, context and where, uh, we, we, where we are uh, moving on. So uh, it's since a while now that uh, we have understood that B cells and the B cells compartment play a central role in the uh, pathogenesis of anchor associated vasculitis. Uh, the B cells are 
um, able to produce the ANCA, which uh, they're told to be pathogenic and they probably saw. Uh, the B cells interact with the T cells and leads to the development of T effectory memory cells, which contributes to the damage to the vasculitic process, and B and T cells interact. Uh, uh, leading to the production of inflammatory cytokines that uh, help out uh, neutrophils to get primed, to get activated, and uh, helps out in the development of the uh, manifestation of the disease. And um, therefore, targeting the B-cell compartment has a strong rationale, and all the guidelines now, also the, the updated KDGO 2014, suggest uh, rituximab as a key player in this, uh, in this field. For sure, as induction regimen, rituximab may be uh, applied to the vast majority of the context of patients with ANC-associated uh, vasculitis. And uh, uh, throughout the years now, we also uh, started to understand that rituximab is probably uh, the best option in order to maintain remission in patients with ANC-associated vasculitis. So you can see here on your left, the data of the main rituximab one uh, trial where uh, patients were mainly with new diagnosis of the disease and induced with cyclophosphamide were uh, maintained with rituximab 500 milligram a day uh, 0 14 and then month 6 uh, uh, 12 18 uh, or azathioprine and in this context rituximab was superior to uh, azathioprine in order to maintain remission on your right you can see the rituximab trial recently published that focused mainly on patients with uh, um, relapsing disease, only patients with relapsing disease, to be honest, and rituximab was given one gram every four months at, up to month 16, and also in this context, the rituximab was superior to azathioprine in order to maintain remission. But uh, the extensive use of rituximab in anchor associated vasculitis provided us also of another biomarker, uh, a further biomarker compared to ANCA, which are B cells. And the idea that B cells and ANCA may act as biomarkers of relapse risk has been around for a while. And this has led to the, the study, the Meritsan 2 study, where uh, two groups of patients were compared. One patient received rituximab as a fixed schedule, as in Meritsan 1 study already showed to you. And uh, the second group received rituximab only at the moment of uh, uh, increase of the ANCA titer or reappearance of the B cells. And in this study, it didn't show any difference in terms of relapse free survival, but was probably under power, was under power in terms of, um, uh, of, of study. And uh, what it did show was an increase uh, uh, overall relapse risk, an increased risk of major relapses in the patients that treated with a tailored infusion. Uh, approach, suggesting that uh, this tailored infusion approach uh, uh, may be risky for the, uh, for the patients. Uh, this is a recent publication, it's very nice, uh, uh, it comes from the French Vasculitis Study Group uh, and it includes Meritsan 1, Meritsan 2, already mentioned to you, and the Meritsan 3. The Meritsan 3 basically randomized patients that were in remission after the Meritsan 2 to receive 18 months of placebo or 18 months of additional rituximum. So uh, in this context, we then have several groups of patients. Uh, we have patients treated with azathioprine, patients treated with 18-month fixed schedule rituximab, patients treated with 18-month individually tailored rituximab, patients treated with 18-month tailored rituximab, and then 18-month fixed rituximab, and patients treated with 18-month fixed rituximab, 18-month fixed rituximab. So lots of combination. And what in this study um, the investigators look at was the risk of relapse at 84 months. So the take-home message is here that the azathioprine group is doing worse compared to all the other group. And the uh, second group doing worse, at, the, at least in terms of major relapses, are, is the, the group treated with 18 months individually tailored rituximab. Uh, the other uh, take-home message, in my opinion, is that if you want to be sure that the, your patient with anti-associated vasculitis maintain a long-term remission, the safest thing to do is to keep on giving rituximab. As you can see here, the group treated with 36 months uh, fixed rituximab basically have a low, the lowest risk of um, major relapses and the lowest risk of overall relapses 
at all. Uh, so this is the uh, context we are moving on in terms of evidence, in terms of guidelines, in terms of publication. And in this context, I'm going to try to uh, uh, talk about biomarks of infective risk in everyday clinical life, and I'm going to focus on B cells and uh, uh, IgG. So uh, talking about B cells, um, we have seen uh, trials, we have seen guidelines, but uh, uh, things in terms of B cell, how the B cell compartment uh, in ICA associated vasculitis behave after treatment with rituximab is something uh, quite complex and is something that probably we uh, do not understand completely uh, yet. Uh, this is an early experience in 2000 of 2017 showing that patients treated with rituximab uh, in the, with a diagnosis of ANC associated vasculitis have a, a significantly lower um, proportion of repopulation of the B-cell compartment 12 months after rituximab, at least compared to other diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and connective tissue disease. So the B-cell compartment of this disease is something different compared to other diseases. And this is something that has interested my center since uh, quite a while now and has led to this data that I'm, uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, these are 71 AAV patients treated with rituximab as induction and then just observed. Nothing as maintenance therapy, just low dose uh, glucocorticoid. And uh, these patients were mainly MPA, 75%, MPO ANCA positive, 75%. They all uh, but two were at the first diagnosis of the disease, first flare of the disease. Kidney involvement in 80% of the cases with low GFR, 23. So this is the uh, population we are starting with. And as you can see from this uh, plot, lots of patients uh, experience a very sustained B cell depletion. Uh, here the uh, blue column represents B cell depletion, the red one represents B cell repopulation. And as you can see, there's a huge variability, but uh, the time uh, during which patients remain depleted is on average very long. And in, in the, analyzing all the data together, the medium time to repopulation was 39 months. On average, these uh, uh, preceded the relapse. You can see on your, on, on your right the risk of flare, but in some patients, uh, the repopulation happened after the flare of the disease. So we then have a look uh, if uh, this uh, sustained B cell depletion was in some way clinical relevant. So we had a look to the patients according to whether or not uh, they experienced B cell repopulation within 39 months, which uh, as you may remember was the medium time of the overall repopulation. We of course uh, uh, removed from this analysis the patient that experienced flares before 39 months, and then we focus on the risk of flares and infection after the 39 months. So what we found it was that patients that remain B cell depleted up to 39 months has a significantly lower risk of flare after that, but an increased risk of serious infection compared to the patients that experience B cell repopulation within the 39 months. So it looks like that this sustained B cell depletion is clinically relevant. It, it's, it's, it's associated to the uh, relapse, uh, risk of relapse, but also to risk uh, of serious infection. And this population, uh, if treated with a fixed interval uh, rituximab dose, may end up being over-treated. We also have a look at factors, clinical factors associated to the risk of uh, B cell repopulation, to the time of B cell repopulation, and we found that gender and the GFR were the main determinants. And basically, female patients repopulate earlier compared to male patients, and patients with a better GFR repopulate earlier compared to the patients with a worse GFR. So we do have some clinical information about that. The only issue is that we don't have biomarker at the moment that are able to predict how a patient is going to, to behave and when a patient is going to um, repopulate. Another interesting topic is to look at the quality of the B cell repopulation, because in the end, uh, experiencing B cell repopulation after a B cell depleting event is physiological. Uh, so uh, some uh, investigators had a look uh, in the composition of the B cell repopulation and look if this may 
in some way uh, be associated to the risk of flare. This study, uh, that is actually the extension of a, a previous study, identified that patients repopulating with a, uh, mainly with naive B cell have a lower risk of relapse, uh, have a delayed relapse compared to the patients repopulating with other um, quality, other kind of B cells. And this study of Alviseberti focusing on the uh, RAVE cohort identified that patients repopulating uh, with a high proportion of autoreactive PR3 plasma blast were at higher risk of relapse compared to the patients uh, repopulating with a low uh, proportion of PR3 positive plasma blast. The main issue also with these two approaches are that uh, we don't have a, a priori information on how the, the single patient is going to behave and in the end uh, these determinations are not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, routinely performed in the, in the labs. What about IgG? Uh, when we talk about hypogamma globulinemia in anchor-associated vasculitis, I think it's uh, uh, worth uh, uh, dividing the topic in two sessions. Uh, one, when we focus on the first 12 months after the disease onset or the flare of the disease and therefore the start of the induction therapy and, uh, and another section when we focus on what happens after the first uh, 12 months because things are slightly different. So in the first 12 months, uh, this is something that has uh, in interest, of course, the European Vasculitis Society and we run within the EOVAS group this study that collected 227 AAV patients treated with rituximab. We defined hypogamma globulinemia as IgG level lower than 7, and we look at the rate of hypogamma globulinemia six months after induction, after a rituximab-based induction. And we identified that 33% of the patients who develop hypogamma globulinemia in this context, hypogamma globulinemia seems to be clinically relevant because patients that developed severe infection within six months after induction with rituximab had lower IgG compared to the patients that would not develop severe infection. And this has been some way replicated in another context. This is a Japanese cohort. As you can see here, um, the study focused on the patients that would develop hypogamma globulinemia uh, defined as uh, uh, IgG level lower than 500 within 24 weeks uh, from the induction regimen. And the outcome was the risk of infection in the first year. And as you can see, patients with hypogamma globulinemia defined as before at the higher risk of infection during the first year of treatment. So hypogamma globulinemia is relevant in terms of biomarker of infection risk during the first year of therapy. We also try to identify factors associated to the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia and we identify age and the glucocorticoid dose at the moment of the induction as the main factor. So older patients and patients treated with more steroids have an higher risk of hypogamma globulinemia. And this has been replicated also in the Japanese cohort I was mentioning you before. And actually this cohort identified the same pattern of risk and the same pattern of uh, developing uh, of clinical relevance of hypogamma globulinemia also in patients treated with other um, immunosuppression, in this case with cyclophosphamide, and suggesting that uh, um, this is not a rituximab-related thing. This is probably related to uh, several contexts. Uh, this is the French vasculitis study group experience that, identity, that explored other uh, the factors associated to the risk of gamma globulin decrease after induction. They identified factors that have been already mentioned, and on top of that also uh, low IgG level to begin with. So patients with low gamma globulin to begin with, uh, to, uh, at the moment of the induction regimen, were at higher risk of developing hypogamma globulin. So during the first month, I think things are relatively uh, easy. Hypogamma globulinemia is uh, clinically relevant, uh, and let's say age, glucocorticoid dose, and low IgG level to begin with are associated to the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia. What about the further 12 months? Uh, so um, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is a paper of 2015, but still I think very interesting, uh, that explored uh, the uh, hypogamma globulinemia risk in patients treated with rituximab maintenance therapy as per the 
uh, Cambridge, let's say, schedule. So one gram of rituximab every six months for around two years. And these are mainly GPA and MPA patients, as you can see, 56%, but there are also some other diagnoses included. And hypogammaglobulinemia was defined, as you can see uh, on, the, on the screen. So what it was observed was that the risk of developing any kind of hypogammaglobulinemia after rituximab initiation and, and after a median time of 42 months is higher and uh, compared to uh, the IgG level at uh, rituximab initiation. But uh, whether or not this is clinically relevant, it was debated. If we focus on the 4% of the patients that develop severe hypogammaglobulinemia, we can see that this was transient in five out of 10 patients. And when this was persistent in five out of 10 patients, a good proportion of patients, three out of five, would not develop any infection. And this has been further explored in the extension of this study I showed you that included 71 AAV patients on an overall cohort of 142. And as you can see on your right, uh, uh, the IgG level the patient fell into changes during the time. So some patient had a normal or very low IgG level at 12 months, and, and their strata changes at 60 months. You can see patients with normal IgG who develop severe hypogammaglobulinemia, and patients with normal uh, with severe hypogammaglobulinemia at 12 months uh, would then move to other strata like normal levels. So there's a high variability uh, there's a, uh, in, this, uh, in, to, in terms of IgG level. And as you can see on the bottom, once again, uh, there's no clear correlation of IgG level with the risk of infection. Uh, in this study, factors associated to the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia or needle replacement IgG at 60 months have been explored, and uh, female gender pre-rituximab exposure to cyclophosphamide Nadir IgG level within the first year uh, have been, and uh, prednisolone use at 12 months have been identified as uh, the risk uh, uh, the risk factors. So I think we have here quite a, a complex topic when we talk about hypogamma globulinemia risk in AAV patients. We have uh, um, uh, to consider that this is clinically relevant during the first 12 months. The fact that the IgG level correlates with the risk of infection after the first 12 months during the maintenance phase, let's say, is less clear. We do have factors associated to the risk of hypogamma globulinemia, which are glucocorticoidose, age, and low IgG during the first 12 months, uh, and pre-rituximum cyclophosphamide exposure, nadir IgG level at, during the first 12 months, and prednisone use at 12 months as risk factor for IgG level. Uh, for uh, hypogamma globulinemia after the first 12 months. But in the end, our diseases, AAV, are chronic relapsing diseases. And so patients may, may move from, you know, remission to a flare. And at that point, also the hypogamma globulinemia develop uh, later on during the disease course of the patients, let's say after the first 12 months, may become clinically relevant uh, since it's going to impact the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia during the first 12 months after a flare and induction regimen is employed. So we have a circularity here of this topic, and this makes the things, in my opinion, very stimulating, but also very complex to, to interpret. So uh, in conclusion of this brief overview, um, I, I, I hope to have convinced you that time to be severe population after rituximab in AAV patient is highly variable. Some patients experience very profound and very prolonged uh, B cell depletion. This is clinically relevant uh, and uh, it impacts uh, the risk of flare, but also the risk of infection. So, in this context, B cells may act as biomarker of infective risk. Hypogamma globulinemia is clinically relevant and associated to infective risk mainly during the first year after induction treatment for active disease and is influenced by glucocorticoidose, age, and IgG level. The clinical relevance of hypogamma globulinemia after the first year of the um, flare of the disease during the so-called maintenance therapy is probably less uh, uh, relevant uh, from the clinical point of view, but uh, it may impact the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia if a further induction is needed, and therefore things need to be interpreted in this context. And there's a, a circularity between IgG level throughout the patient journey 
and uh, this should be taken into account and, if, and of course it's something that may impact patient uh, prognosis. I take a few seconds to uh, thank all the group here in Brescia that contributes to the management of uh, patients with ankle associated vasculitis, international friends and collaboration and collaborators and uh, thank you for, for the attention. So thank you very much. Um, it was a great overview of both of the speakers. Uh, I, at least I really enjoy hearing it. I'm always learning with you. Um, so while we are waiting for questions, um, I may start asking questions. So I'm just monitoring the chat. Um, please feel free to write anything you want. I think it's really important to take all the questions now because as you have seen, uh, it's still a bit debatable how things should work. Um, considering the B-cell depletion, yes or no. Um, so, but in practical terms, I have a question for you, Andreas, first. So, um, before all the papers you've shown with rituximab, we knew that with cyclophosphamide, we had to do cotrimoxazole, so prophylaxis uh, of, um, of the girovesi. However, when rituximab started to be more used, we had, and particularly with the maintenance treatment, we had, some questions because, of course, for induction you should do a prophylaxis, but then we have papers saying you should do maintenance for two to four years, so that's a long time to be on cotrimoxazole. Do you have any advice on how should we manage then stopping cotrimoxazole? Um, at what period should, or should we maintain because you showed data that was still uh, some benefic benefits from one year or two from what I recall? So do you have any advice, practical term? Well, this is a very good point. I think um, I can't really say anything very strong here because um, we don't have the data for that. Um, I think it's important to do these studies to look at what's the benefit beyond six months, for instance. Um, the issue is that such a trial, I tried to set that up, um, does not get funded because it's just too boring for funding agencies, but it would be very, very important. I agree with you. And, and this is the main issue for that. So if you look at the RAVE data, clearly after six months, you don't see that many infections. So in my personal practice, uh, as soon as I reach zero milligram of steroids and the patients are asking me to reduce the pill burden, I'm also usually stopping DMP SMX except patients have you know, significant lung involvement or comorbidities, then I continue. But if a patient is very active, um, has a good exercise capacity, I do stop it normally and don't give it during maintenance treatment of reduximab. So, but only when you reach like after six months or when you reach zero milligrams of steroids? Well, usually I try to cut steroids by five months. So actually six months is then, you know, the time when I stop the MTSMX as well. Okay, that, that's important because I think the guidelines uh, suggest uh, below 15 milligrams of steroids you can consider stopping. So it would mm. be a bit different. And now with the Vacopan, it would be even more different because the steroids would not be given until six months. So still we yeah. have that issue. We can... A Vacopan is another issue because... Um, of course, it has also some kind of predilection for liver toxicity and DMP SMX. One of the complications of it is, of course, also an uh, increase in transaminases and, and, of course, liver toxicity. So this is really a, a complicated field, or it's getting more complicated, I would say. Yeah. So thank you very much. Now I have a question uh, on the chat, I think, from Federico. So, do you always give IgIG if the IgG is below three grams per liter in the course of treatment? So, when would you give IgIG? I think that's basically. I, I think it's uh, this is a common approach. It's not only myself, but uh, uh, nobody's giving IgG uh, IgIG only based basing only on, on uh, IgG levels. As I showed you. Some patients have very low level of IgG and would not develop infection, and some other patients uh, would have, you know, only moderate uh, reduction of IgG and develop recurrent infection. So this is a call to be made uh, on the single patient according to, uh, you know, the whether or not is going to develop uh, recurrent infection. 
Okay, but by default, do you give it always below three or not? You always look at the patient individually. Yes, I'm not giving in the, if, if a patient has very low IgG level with no infection, I'm not giving him a IVIG replacement. Okay, that, that's important because in practical terms in my center, it's usually we give it, so it's important. That, that's very good to have your experience as well here. That, that, that's my, my experience. We may be, you know, or more concerned in terms of, uh, you know, be careful in not exceeding glucocorticoid dose if uh, the patient needs need to increase it, but uh, um, that's my approach. I don't know if Andreas has a different one. Andreas, regarding giving IVIG, um, which yeah, doctor would you? Yeah, only in the context of serious infections, but my impression is once you refer the patient to an immunologist or also respiratory medicine doctor, they are usually coming back with IVIG. Um, because they also count non-serious infections as complications and then you never know. I think I'm very restrictive to give it, but um, but I think, uh, you know, it's it, in terms of practicability, I think some countries are never using it, some are overusing it. Um, and it clearly depends, you know, how easy your access to IVIG is and how expensive it is in your center. I don't see the value of, of using it in those patients not presenting with serious infections or repetitive infections. Yeah, thank you. Now I have a question for both of you. I um, don't know who wants to answer first. It's quite controversial. So I'm going to read it. Do you think that Avacapan use will help us? Um, is there any data yet to support this in real world? Do you have much experience? Well, there is data, but please give us our experience. <laughs> Your experience, please. I think maybe you start in order, Federico. Or your Andres was the last one. Could you give us your? So experience? we still have to, you know, understand completely the, the Abacopan story. Of course, uh, is a very interesting drug with lots, lots of potential. And uh, uh, I don't know if this is the context to go into detail uh, for that. Uh, from the uh, to to get uh, to remain, you know, stick to the. Uh, topic of today, which is infection. I think the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, um, it's a drug that allows you to uh, spare uh, glucocorticoids, and uh, the advocate trial showed uh, a numerical reduction of uh, infection and severe infection in patients uh, in the avacopanal compared to the glucocorticoid one. So, this is very interesting. Uh, that was not statistically significant. Uh, the risk of severe infection got statistically significant once, uh, uh, you know, advocate clear and classic study were put together. And this is an abstract that was presented at the ASN uh, and I think also ACR uh, in one of the past editions. So it looks like that, uh, you know, giving avacopan, you save glucocorticoid and you reduce also the risk of infection that during the first year are mainly related to glucocorticoids. And uh, another th interesting thing in my mind, but of course we don't have data at the moment, it regards the circularity of the IgG I was showing you before. So starting an induction with low IgG increased the risk of developing hypogamma globulinemia and therefore infection. In this context, of course, uh, uh, giving you a treatment that uh, would save glucocorticoid would reduce that risk. Of course, we don't have, you know, the uh, sub-analysis focus specifically on the IgG level, but there's a strong rationale in that. So I think that, uh, yes, the, the drug is going to provide, to be helpful and uh, to in, uh, in order to reduce the infective risk uh, in, uh, in the patient. And so far, it seems to be, uh, to be safe. Of course, as Andreas mentioned before, we still need to understand how the liver toxicity things is going to unfold. Thank you. Andres, you have anything to add? No, that was uh, that was really a, a good answer. I think it's like the best you can answer it. Um, I think, you know, personal experience with the drug is, is limited to close to 10 patients now. And it's difficult to say, you know, from your experience, how that would, you know, be generalizable um, for the whole population. But of course, you use it for a purpose, and, and that is, of course, reduction of comorbidities and also improvement in, uh, in GFR. So 
I think these are also important outcomes, not only the, the reduction of infections. Okay, so another question for both of you uh, again. So would you try antibi antibiotic prophylaxis for encapsulated bugs before IVIG? So before considering IVIG, would you try antibiotic prophylaxis? Maybe Federico. Well, uh, I started, this is a difficult one. Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, whenever I get into antibiotic prophylaxis in all the fields I'm working in nephrology, it, ne it is never indicated. So <laughs> my, my gut feeling is uh, probably no. Uh, and if the patient has a uh, uh, you know, recurrent infection, uh, uh, at that point I would consider IVAG, even if uh, it doesn't have uh, a hypogamma globulinemia. So the, I think that um, you know, the IVAG replacement should really stick with the uh, uh, infection risk rather than the IgG level. Of course, if if he's got both, you're probably more positive in doing uh, in, in doing that. But if the patient has only a mild hypogamma globulinemia, let's say in recurrent infection, IVIG should be indicated. And as far as I'm aware, uh, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give a try to you know uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And you still have the culture marks as well at the beginning. The business. Exactly. Yes. And uh, the, 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 talking about cotrimoxazole. Uh, our approach uh, is slightly different. We, we try to, to keep on maintaining it during the, uh, the therapy, at least until the patient is B cell depleted. And I don't think there are data there. It's probably it's, it's just our, uh, our approach. And of course, there are these data showing at some point that cotrimoxazole was also beneficial in terms of disease flare. Also, these one are very weak data. So putting all together, our approach is that one, but I, I'm, I'm very well aware there's no strong evidence on that. Yeah, oh, that's an interesting point. So, uh, Andreas, would you like to add anything related to um, no. <laughs> Okay, so I'll give you the next question. <laughs> okay, so there is a question on: Do you continue rituximab if the IgG level is below three? Uh, is below three to four grams per liter? So severe hypo gamma globulinemia after previous rituximab, would you, uh, and no infection? So if you have a patient that has no infection, has this level of between three and four or even lower, would you continue to give rituximab? Or for instance, and I am here adding something, would you space it like, instead of doing every six months, would you space it for one year, for instance, could be another approach? So certainly things to consider here, I think uh, one is, of course, how long have you already given rituximab because at a certain point I try at least to, um, to reduce it or to stop it. So let's say in treatment naive patients or in relapse naive patients after two years, if they keep on relapsing, I try to continue rituximab as long as possible. Um, and then try to space it out at a certain um, stage to what is needed. And, and clearly, um, Federico showed B cell repopulation is, a, is a, a marker you can use as immunocompetence, but, but also, of course, IgG is a marker of immunocompetence. If it's low, he showed that the relapse rate is also low. There's data from the US showing that when you are running a low IgG, you don't relapse necessarily. So I think there is a good rationale in such a patient to try to stop reduximab altogether and then just watch the space and see if something is happening. And then you can read those. Um, in the context of no infections, personally, I wouldn't be that reluctant to give more reduximab. Okay, that's interesting. Well, for instance, if it's a patient who is PR3 positive, we know it relapses a lot, and actually the PR3 levels are kind of rising, maybe, and nothing else. Yeah, I think there are a lot of scenarios where you want to continue rituximab um, yeah. in the context of anchor positivity continuously. I think, you know, for instance, Marta's data from the Mayo Clinic have shown clearly if you're remaining MPO anchor positive, you have a 30% relapse rate uh, risk uh, over the next years. So I think, you know, there are circumstances where you want to continue, but also good arguments here um, where you want to stop treatment altogether. Okay. So I think one more question is on the chat and we have to close. So there is a question, when should immunization be initiated? Um, of course, it will. I think it depends on the patient, but uh, he, there is some scenarios like before starting immunization or at before starting immunization or at maintenance treated. 
treatment or before induction therapy? What do you do when you do all the vaccinations, etc.? So before induction therapy, I think it makes no sense because you should treat the patient as soon as you have the diagnosis and uh, don't delay treatment. Um, but it is then, pretty... for instance, you only have to do some vaccines. Would you wait like after three months of rituximab for some have more B cells, or then well, you three just do it right away? Three months is not long enough. I think we know from the COVID era that you need at least five months, six months, seven months actually to, to mount uh, some kind of response, not really a good response. I mean, there has been data that D cells are also very important and that is maintained um, despite rituximab treatment. But I think this is a very, very difficult one and you can't really give a, a good answer on that. So as, as, as long as possible, um, after the last reduximab, I think five and a half months is so my practice if they receive it um, every six months. But that's, I don't know if that's working better or not. I don't know. Because if you give vaccinations, you still have some sort of immunization, although it's not perfect. So, and yeah. Federico, what, what's your, uh, what's your, yeah, take no, on? It's, uh, we, we learned a lot during the COVID area of this, of this aspect. So being B cell depleted, basically, uh, it gives you the possibility to have any, any response. In our, in our ends, uh, three, four, five cells uh, in, the, in the circulation were sufficient to have some kind of response to the vaccination, but being to zero was uh, uh, no response at all. And uh, yes, of course, there, there's the T cell compartment, as Andreas uh, correctly mentioned. So um yeah my suggestion is to uh you know if you're not monitoring b cell routinely try to vaccinate you know the uh you know the further possible from the last rituximab infusion and if you monitor the b cells try to get that point where the patient is uh, is, a, is at least some degree of repopulation okay so you don't give it right away because you could do like an induction because it's life-saving you have to treat the patient immediately but you could also do the vaccines like in within the month or the first month because you still can have some response although it's not great you still can have some so and there is some interesting data from the french vasculitis study group there you just double the dose or do more doses of the vaccine maybe it's more efficient i don't know if you have any experience on that so instead of giving like, for instance, for, for, for the flu vaccine, if you double the flu vaccine, do two instead of one, maybe it has more response. I don't know if you have. I think this was uh, um, an abstract they presented at, in mm -hmm. Barcelona about pneumococcal vaccination. And I think this is a, a very nice strategy, but, but still the response rate was pretty low. I think it was around 30%, right, um, against several important um, serotypes so even though it's a very uh, nice way i think you're still not mounting a good response in most patients and i think we need to be more creative in a way but of course doubling the dose or increasing the dose makes makes sense if you want to generate some kind of response yeah. that would be interesting to know in long term because yeah. also the vaccine for pneumococcus has changed and so we're still adjusting as well Okay, so I think that's it. Um, thank you very much for both of you for this excellent talks and for the audience for staying and until the end. I think this was really important to, to see um, the experience of both these consultants in nephrology who have a lot of experience on treating these patients. Um, and I think that's it. Um, hope to see you in the next UVAS uh, slash Rita lunchtime uh, regarding vasculitis. And again, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Ciao, ciao.